Following the dormancy of the Nigerian refineries to refine crude, the imports of premium auto spirit, otherwise known as petrol by the National, Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, has risen by 100 million liters. Latest figures from the Financial and Operations Report of the NNPC shows that no fuel had been produced by the refineries for about 13 months running. The oil firm stated that uh, in compliance with the Public Procurement Act of 2007 and NNPC's policy and procedures, it had to engage qualified and credible companies in a direct sale of crude and direct purchase of petroleum products to ensure sustained product supply across the country. The NNPC says it imported 1.68 billion liters of petrol through the DS. DP, uh, while 1.58 billion liters PMS was imported in the preceding month. Under the section of petroleum product supply from domestic refineries, the oil firm stated that the facilities were dormant in terms of crude oil refining, and this had stretched for over a year. The report also shows that no white product, that is PMS and dual purpose kerosene, was produced in January 2021 and apparently for the past 12 months consecutive months, and this is attributed to the ongoing rehabilitation works at the refineries. Rising inflation has been the macroeconomic problem in Nigeria that seems to be intractable uh, over the years, and this has made the government adopt various measures, both monetary and fiscal policies, to curb and reduce inflation growth to an acceptable level. But all these policies seem to have no effect at the moment. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, headline inflation for the month of March rose to 18.17% uh, from 17.33% recorded in February 2021, while the food inflation rose to 22.95% in March from 21.79% in the previous month. Nigeria's continuous rise in inflation is detrimental to its growth due to its structural deficiency, logistics problem, insecurity, and many other factors which are not showing any signs of abating. Given the continuous rise in inflation rate and the slow growth of GDP by 0.11% in quarter 4 of 2020, it is projected that the Monetary Policy Committee at its next meeting will raise the monetary policy rate uh, from 11.5%, maybe to 12%, as inflation rate would likely maintain its upward trend in 2021. We're joining me live in our Lagos studio to discuss this and, of course, more issues that have to do with the Nigerian economy. Is the Chief Investment Officer at Afri Invest Assets Management Limited, Mr. Robert Omotude. Good afternoon, Mr. Omotude. It's good to have you. In the Thank studio. you very much for, for having me. Uh, looking at the trajectory of the figures we have with inflation, what we've seen in months, take us through what you expect. Obviously, they said even not being an economist, we know we are going up. But Absolutely. what do you think? Let's look at what, what we, from May until now, or maybe from September to where we are. Let's just look at some months back. I mean, so yes, if you look at the inflation trajectory, uh, since I would say the September of 2019, we've been seeing continuous uptick. Uh, between September 2019 and September 2020, the uptick was somewhat, I think, around 200 basis point movement. That's uh, uh, within one year. But if you look at the movement between 2020 September till date, it's been a significant move from as low as 13% levels in 2013, uh, I mean in 2020, September, to as high as, you know, the current level we are having now, which is 18.73%, I mean 18.17% as at March uh, 2021. Now, everybody expects that it will go higher this time around. Uh, and by the time a pre-inflation is released, uh, which we should be getting, if not today, by early tomorrow, yeah. uh, we should be inching higher to 18.73%. And I dare say that we almost cannot avoid a 19% inflation levels by the time the May inflation is coming out. Yeah. And the reasons are not far-fetched. You know, we've analyzed it uh, severally. Yeah. Now, some of the increases or the upticks we've seen over the you know, past months have been due to some of, you know, like, should I say, the consequences of some of the actions that have been taken from border closure to slight increases in electricity tariffs that we saw to increases in pump price of petrol 
uh, and then to rising insecurity in the country, you know, because food inflation still accounts for the larger chunk. I mean, today we are talking about um, headline inflation at 18.17%. But indeed, food inflation is as high as 23%. You know, so, and I think that by the time we are seeing the 20, I mean, the, uh, the April, April figure, figures. we are likely going to be hitting 24% mm -hmm. in terms of headline, I mean, food, food inflation. inflation. Now, this is not particularly cheering because, again, this are the, is, is, should I say, is the import of some of the security concerns we're seeing, you know, widespread security concerns, which is not just limited to the food bed or the food region of the country anymore, you know. But, of course, because the consumer price index that we use to measure inflation today is heavily composed of food. You know, and it's understandably so because when you look at the income of the people and what they spend on food is quite higher, you know, relative to other countries of the world. And that's why food accounts for the larger chunk of our, you know, headline inflation. Will it get better? Unfortunately, I don't think so. Because when you look at all the pressure points, you know, we are not seeing uh, what will likely bring that respite at the moment, right? So let's look at the pressure coming from food. Right. So if you look at, you know, most of the food items, yeah. as, we, as we mentioned, farm produce, produce coming from the, you know, the north central, the so, northwestern part of the country. You know, these are places where you see the farmer, farmers, headers, uh, clashes. You know, we have uh, kidnappings. We have, you know, all sorts of security issues, you know, coming from that region. Are farmers able to go to the farm and do their business without fear of being niched or, you know, or, or being killed? No, that's not the case. So what you then see is you see a situation where most farmers have practically abandoned their farms for safety, you know, because they want to stay alive. Now, the import of that is that they are not able to carry out those activities. So the food supply is getting shorter and shorter. And you know, the demand supply dynamics will suggest if your demand remains the same and the supply is limited, the natural thing to see is uh, spikes in prices, and which is what we are seeing right now. So higher prices coming from food is not necessarily going to abate. We can look at the other sources of, you know, uh, of um, the, uh, the consumer price index in this case, energy. Now, from energy, we are talking about electricity tariff and pump price yeah, of petrol. Yeah, yeah, Where very recently, NMPC announced that they won't be making any contribution to, to the FARC. to FAC allocation. Yeah. Now, this has prompted the you know governors to start clamoring for the removal of subsidy. <laughs> I mean, these are things that we we've, we've analyzed for more than. You know, I mean, you can talk about subsidy removal advocacy. It's been on for up to two decades in Nigeria, if no more, in Nigeria today. So, but now the reality is dawning on most of the, you know, people in government That's that subsidy payment is not sustainable. It is not even optimal for a country where you have most of your people living below poverty line. And the people that, you know, consume this so-called um, uh, fuel are not the masses, to be honest with you. Uh, and of, of course, you can reduce the consumption of the masses to, you know, most of them don't own cars, you know, some of them cannot even have, uh, afford generators, you know, so they, they just, you know, live by subsistence on a daily basis. So when you now take a larger chunk of the country's resources to now fund the lifestyle of the middle class and the, and the affluent, you know, definitely is not the best way to allocate our resources. So what we would expect is that uh, because, again, the, what touches the heart of most of the politicians is being affected, which is FAC allocation, yeah. we are thinking that, okay, voices of reasoning will prevail at this time and then subsidy can be done away with. The consequence of that is that pump price of petrol will keep rising. Now, when pump price rises, you see the impact on inflation as well because energy component accounts for yeah. close to 15% of. of the consumer price in this. Mm -hmm. Then you talk about electricity tariff. We don't have light today because um, we, are not, we are not ready to have light yet. We are not ready to be competitive. We are not ready to be competitive. <laughs> because if you look at those who are into the business of power, right, they are ready to keep supplying you for as long as you're ready to pay. Yeah. 
on a willing buyer, I mean, I think it was a former minister yes, that started that Shala. approach, yes. and it worked yes. perfectly. perfectly. Today, there is an estate very close to us here, you know, on the basis of that willing buyer, willing seller. I know, I know of Sura Market, you know, I know of Ariaria Market is, in, um, I mean, in the East, I yes. know of Sabongiri Market in Kano. Absolutely. They are all under the scheme, and it's and working. And it's working, because with you. even when the grid is broken, the discos will go to any length to get supplies for these clusters of consumers they are because they are paying. And now these are places where the efficiency is very high. They've metered these people, right? So there is no loss yeah. by, you know, yeah. not collecting. Yeah. Yeah. So the people are, met are metered. There are, there are no thefts, you know. Even if there are, they are very, very minimal. Yeah. The high rate of collection, you know, is helping the model. And then the discos continue to supply that market. I mean, we can analyze that, you know, separately yes, in separately, another, really in another an conversation. conversation. Absolutely. Actually, but, you you know. Know, but again, what you see then is if we move to what we call cost-reflective tariff, you know, because what are the things that will impact on that, you know, what you call levelized cost of electricity? You know, because most of the turbines here in Nigeria are fired by gas, you know, so as uh, uh, crude oil prices are moving higher, you expect that the gas prices will be moving higher as well. That will impact on the tariff. Mm. You know, the inf inflation rates will impact on tariff. Exchange rate will impact on tariff. You know, so every now and then you can see changes in tariff because it's cost reflective. The good thing is people get the power, mm. you know. So this is another pressure point for consumer price in there. So when you look at energy and food, those two alone, right, they are, they are significant enough True. to continue to put more pressure on the, uh, on, on the on inflation rate. The other point will be to look at what we call imported inflation, you know, maybe by, you know, items that are imported that are exchange rate sensitive. And we talk about exchange rates administration in a state that we are now, where central bank has been trying all the code to ensure that the demand side is managed. But our appetite for Foreign exotic products, products is, is, is too high, you know. So containing it is very difficult. It's a difficult job on the part of the central bank. Maybe that is why we need to also adopt what we call a market reflective approach to managing our foreign Forex. exchange. I am one of those that believe in the fundamental principles of the market system to solving every problem. Demand and supply? I am telling you. <laughs> it, I mean, every human being is rational, right? <laughs> so if I have opportunity to get exchange rate at 415 or 10, as it is now at the INE FX window, and somebody else is buying it at 485 or 500, depending on what you need it for, the guy that is buying at 485 will be more rational than the guy that is able to buy it at 415. Because if you look at your level of income, right, the, the Naira stock is what will chase the limited supply of dollars that you have. So if you have so much uh, to pay for one dollar, and you have much less to pay for the same one dollar, the person that is paying so much will have to be more rational. Because your limit, your, it is assumed that your income is at least limited per time. You know, if you're converting your salaries to dollars, it's limited per time. And if it's your profit you're converting to dollars, it's also limited per time. So the tendency is that you are more rational. That is why demand supply, you know, approach may likely solve this problem. I mean, we've talked about unifying exchange yeah. rate for so long, for so long, you know. But what you just find is we are taking the steps in bits, you know, and in pieces. Right now, we are talking about unification at the I and E FX window, which still has a huge gap yeah. between the I and E FX Honestly. window at 410, and you're talking about 485 70, at the parallel market. There is a third market you likely will not see. <laughs> you know, that's what we call the inflow market, because there is a segregation between um, dollar. Dollar is not dollar in, in Nigeria today. You know, to the, to the creator of the currency, Dollar is dollar, whether it's in cash or inflow. But for, for us here, it's different because if you if you change cash, uh, dollar cash at the you know parallel market, and you pay into your domiciliary account, it's not usable for most investments. You know, so so now the, we created that third market, which is called is a fragmentation of the main market, which you now call the inflow market, where the exchange rate is as high as five hundred naira. 
So, and these are those who want to be able to move the money from this country to maybe offshore. You know, that's why it's called the inflow market because it can we can wire it. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. up and down. So, the tendency now is that because exchange rate is also a factor, it has impact on the headline inflation. So, when you look at it holistically, holistically. in terms of you know the consequences of some of these uh, pressure points we are seeing in terms of headline inflation is actually worrying because you have a country where after COVID-19 struck and all of the pandemic and you know compendium of issues that we have to deal with you know apart from security you find out that the average you know take home of an individual has really Reduce. That, that, that's where I was really good. You know, purchasing power continues to dwindle. Absolutely. Before I left the newsroom, we're talking about it. Yep. And prices continue to be on the high side. Yep. And inflation is also on the high side. Absolutely. So for a Nigerian, what kind of life are we to live? And you're also advocating, and I think I also support it, that subsidies should be removed. Particularly, what's more worrisome, let me quickly touch on this. Yep. is the fact that they are saying that we now consume almost 100 million liters daily. We're on 60 million now, we argued about this. And now people are working from home and we are doing 100 million. There is more to this than it makes Absolutely. Balance. So clearly, when you think about it, right, 100, 100 ah. million liters a day, I can't even imagine, can't imagine how we are able to consume that. But again, it speaks to the point. You see, when there's social intervention, we are here in Nigeria, border to the West, you know, yeah, look at all yeah. the, but, uh, I mean, bordering countries, countries that we have, ours. you know, from the Republic of Benin to Cameroon to fine. Chad, you know, these are places that it's easier for you. I mean, if Nigeria is paying the subsidy, right, and you live close to the border, you can get the products and move it across, you know, the border. But if our prices are reflective, some have done studies to suggest that whilst we are, I mean, buying pump price, I mean, a liter of petrol for... I think what's the price now? Maybe 162, 162. 162 naira, right? If you move across the border, you could be paying as much as 200, 250. 250. Yes. So the margin is enough. That arbitrage Honestly, is enough. So I'm, I'm even surprised that it's 100 million. I would expect 200 million because if you look at the arbitrage, you know, how much can you control? And like one, you know, uh, as in someone I, I, I really ex respect in the industry said it some time ago. Okay, I think it was SLS, um, Sanusi okay, Lamido. He said, the, the, that margin, it, you have more than enough to bribe everybody yeah, yeah. from Lagos yes. to, to Meduguri, to wherever you want to take the product True. to. Because look at the margin from 162 to 250, 250 almost, 100 almost 100 naira. So it's, it's, it's enough for you to bribe your way through to get the products out of the country. So if you want to be serious, let's get away, do away with subsidy. Mm. And let's stop deceiving ourselves. We are not rich. We are broke. And that's why you see the debt, Nigeria's debt profile rising because the government must survive. You know, you must keep paying the bills. Yeah. So because you must keep paying the bills, we go are borrowing, you know, because we don't want to cut down on our spending because when government cuts down on spending, people will say, oh, it's austerity, it's too much. People can't bear it, you know. Yet we have a lot of wastages, you know, going on here and there. Here and there. So subsidy is one thing we should even do away with. And the, the purchasing power you mentioned is, is actually quite worrisome, you know. Because if you look at an average person who earns, you know, say, even if you earn as much as 200000 in a month, mm -hmm. and your salary has not changed for the last one year, yes. you're worse off today. Sure. You know, because when you, <laughs> you know, the purchasing power is actually what the money you are holding in your hand can buy. You know, just take 10,000 naira to the market before you buy one thing. You know, the money is gone. gone. So when we talk about, you know, uh, people getting poorer, these are some of the factors. And that's why we must do something to put a rein on inflation. I, I am not envying anybody in the Monetary Policy Committee at honestly, this time. Honestly. You know, Central Bank has the most difficult job at this time because the situation is more peculiar because we now have what we call slow growth. I mean, as a Q4, we grew at 0.11%. That was after we recorded two consecutive quarters of losses. You know, we, we were down 5.9% and then, you know, uh, I mean, if you look at the, 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 the rate at which we, we dropped for the first, I mean, for second quarter and third quarter, mm -hmm. before we recorded that marginal growth, you will know that 
is an I would say an anemic level of growth, you know. And if care is not taken, we can easily slip to the negative territory again. So what the MPC will be bothered yes, about yes, that's, that's this time it. around? It's because I, I <laughs> a lot for them. I mean, I there, there's a lot. CBN governor, I don't make any yeah. members of that committee. Actually, there, there's a lot to, to chew. Uh, the challenge for them, though, now is that when you look at the sources of price pressure, they will also have a dilemma, you know, a monetary policy dilemma. Uh, traditionally, or if I say theoretically, if you want to put a rein on inflation, you raise interest rates. Now, how do you raise interest rate in this kind of environment where the source of that price pressure you're seeing is not because there's so much money in circulation. It's just because we have supply shortfalls that have now led to price increases. So, you know, increasing the interest rate right now, in my view, can actually worsen the situation. Because if you increase interest rates and you know, um, you you price that into credits. Manufacturing companies, you know, manufacturing sector, by the way, is still in recession. You know, just uh, I mean, as we had, you know, even though the economy grew, <laughs> manufacturing sector is in yes. recession as we speak. You know, uh, it was only agri that boosted our performance in Q4. Now, what I'm saying in essence now is that. Even if you now raise the interest rate at this time, the impact on the manufacturing sector and the ripple effect on the overall economy could actually lead to higher inflation. You know, because this is an inflation level that has gone, I mean, it's about the highest level we've seen in recent times. You know, uh, even the 2016 episode, I think inflation peaked at about 18%. Now we've crossed 18%, we've crossed 18. and we can't av av avoid uh, the 19% 19. levels because for May figures, based on our projection, we should hit about 19.1 in May. For this April, we ex expect about 18.7% levels. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time inflation is released later today or uh, first thing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the issue now is that the, the the I think that the Monetary Policy Committee may want to be a bit cautious. Although the, the noise on the street is that probably they will raise interest rates. You know, and there, I, I won't be surprised if there are more members of the committee who will tilt towards that. that. Because if we go by the saying, theoretically, we say inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, that was a statement made by Milton Friedman. Because if you want to drill down you know, uh, into higher inflation levels that we talk about, you can still reduce them to monetary factors somehow you know although we know that the major source is a supply side factor you know which the central bank cannot or should i say do not have absolute control over these are fiscal issues security concerns are not you know uh within the purview of the central bank you know this is within the purview of the fiscal authority yeah. so if security concerns are fully inflation you can see the monetary policy will now have a dilemma yeah. as to how to now attack it so the major thing they can now do is to appeal you know to the government to put a rein on you know security so that i mean we can you know stem the tide from yeah. the security perspective uh in terms of inflation i mean exchange rate i yeah. think they will continue on the path which they have been you know continuing at this time one of the things uh, we have been expecting will cushion the effect is the euro bonds market sale uh, which we are expecting. Uh, we are told that the government would have gone to the market uh, before now, but in their wisdom, um, they probably are still hesitating. Maybe there are still factors they need to check out. Uh, but the point is that by the time we hit that market, we expect close to about $5 billion more uh, to be added yeah, to the current true. reserves. So that means it could, it could give some short-term yeah. you know, relief yeah. for the central bank to now intervene. Because the major challenge we have in the exchange rate now is the intervention. Yeah. The frequency of intervention is as slowed compared to what we used to have. Again, because we've seen uh, drawdown in oil prices. Uh, even though we have recovered somewhat, but again, um, we still have challenges, you know, for production and, honestly, and here and there. Honestly, so we can just go on and so on many the issues bond, the economic <laughs> issues, I tell you. But, you know, Sam, I, I really appreciate you having you on the show. Chief Investment Officer, uh, Free Invest Assets Management Limited, Mr. Robert Omotsundi. Beginning, letting us understand what this means, even for the man on the street. Uh, these figures coming from MBS. We expect uh, the figures before the end of today, like he said, or earlier tomorrow, and we'll be up to speed with that. Thank you very much for Thank spending you. your day with us. I really Thank appreciate you for this. Me. Thank you.